after doing and publishing guidelines a lot over the last years, I was pretty often asked, does the guideline apply to my country, to my region, to my hospital setting? And it wasn't easy to answer the questions. So it would be good if a guideline would apply to different settings. And out of that thought, we were discussing that's Martin Hönigel of the ECMM and myself and some others were discussing couldn't we do one guideline that is applicable to each and any setting. So that was when we started the One World, One Guideline initiative of the ECMM, the European Confederation of Medical Mycology and the Mycosis Study Group Educational Research Council from the US. I am Oliver Connelly from the University of Cologne, infectious disease consultant and director of translational research and clinical trials center. The letter explains why my transparency declaration is always pretty busy because we design clinical trials in anti-infectives and run clinical trials in these drugs. The authors of the mucomycosis guideline is, of course, a long list of names. Everybody here really contributed to an enormous effort that we started at the beginning of 2018 and finally ended at the end of 2019. So it was one year and a bit that uh, the time uh, it took to create the guideline. And we used video methods tutorial because the authors couldn't go for teleconferences covering 17 time zones that was simply not possible. This is the United Nations regions that are represented by the authors and there are some gaps and some countries are not represented and hopefully with other guidelines we will have colleagues who join the team from these countries and let me briefly introduce to you the guideline methodology. It will look familiar because you have seen guidelines using the same methodology. We do have a strength of a recommendation that is graded A, B, C and D. D is the only one against and otherwise it's positive recommendations. And as you can see on the slide, the exact translation, so to say, would be the guideline group strongly or moderately or marginally supports a recommendation for use. Then we do have a second category and that is the quality of evidence and we have levels 1, 2 and 3. And that's relatively easy to memorize because level 1 means at least one properly designed randomized controlled trial which almost never happens with mucomycosis so far. Level three is case reports or opinions of individual experts or groups of experts. And then level two is in the middle. And level two is pretty complex. So, but you can just memorize everything which doesn't fall in one or three is in two. And since two is pretty comprehensive, when you read the guideline and go to the um, substantial number of tables in the guideline, you see a recommendation, it's supported by A1 or B2. So whenever it is a 2, it should come with an index. And that is on this slide, there are five different indices. And one is a little r and tells you it's a review or meta-analysis is the type of level 2 evidence that supports the recommendation. And then we have T, which is transferred evidence from some other population, for example, from adults to pediatric populations or from cancer to non-cancer patients, just two examples. Then if the level two evidence goes back and is supported only by historical controls, then it would come with a little H uh, if that is the comparator group. U is standing for uncontrolled trials and A is abstract only. So if we publish a guideline and we can only rely on an abstract of a study because the full paper is not yet there, then you actually want to know. And sometimes uh, it might be that there is more than one of these letters accompanying a uh, level two evidence. 
Well, let's start with epidemiological um, aspects first. It's truly very difficult because everybody uses a different denominator, different type of patient. Sometimes it's only the absolute number being reported and no denominator at all. So what we did, and Danila Seidel and John Simonton Garcia were instrumental for that approach, we went for published cases per population. And the darker the color of the country on that map, the more cases per population have been published from that country. So it might be that there is a country with a lot of cases, but nobody publishes them, then that would look white, as if there were no cases. Here is the exact definition, and as said, number of published pa patients or cases per population denominator. There are more clinical images than these two in the guideline, but these two are pretty representative. And what you see, uh, the panel A, is a trauma patient, a blunt trauma, and panel G down here is a skin lesion in an allergenic transplant patient where leukemia just grew from, from the sinuses through the bone into the skin and that is where we saw these necrotic lesions, very typical. Some major radiographic signs of mucomycosis are given here and what you see in panel A, top left, a halo sign on a CT, so that ring of ground glass opacity surrounding that nodular infiltrate in the right lung. Then panel B and C are reversed halo signs and reversed halo signs are typical for mucomycosis. There are other diseases that might look like that, but if it's the typical patient, for example, acute myelogenous leukemia with a long neutropenic period and persistent fever, and then develops such CT infiltrates, lung infiltrates, um, as on panel B and C, then that's clearly uh, reversed or inversed halo signs and you must rule out mucomycosis in such a patient. D is the hypodense sign on an MRI this time. It's a central hypodensity in a lung consolidation. E is the vascular occlusion sign on a CT angiography on the far right top hand side. And F is a contiguous spread on a CT scan, so that mucomycosis really starts in the lung and then stretches out through the diaphragm into the spleen. Philip Köhler has published a paper on that recently in CID and uh, that is one of these cases um, and look out for that. And maybe you want to go, if you didn't see it, to that video that is dedicated to exactly that clinical picture or radiographic picture. And then there is another series of inverse halo signs at the bottom where it says day 1, 8 and 15 and actually that is the series of weekly CT scans that were done in that immune suppressed patients and you can see it's an almost explosive growth of that infiltrate of centimeters per day so until the whole lung is destroyed on that right side of the patient. On this slide you see the typical hyphal morphology in mucomycosis and aspergillosis because that usually is the differential diagnosis. So you take your biopsy from a patient ideally and uh, if that is possible and you would find either mucomycosis that would be pretty broad hyphae, 6 to larger than 16, sometimes up to 25 or so micrometers broad ribbon-like structures and bands and 90 degree angles, that would be very typical. Um, there are other aspects that are typical and you will find them in the full paper. Then um, panel B gives you that red material, that hyaline material, and that is actually the splendore Höppli phenomenon. And we are particularly thankful as group of authors that one of us, um, Henrik 
Jensen from Denmark provided that rare slide to us. And in C, at the lower end, that's Aspergillus. So um, it's much smaller hyphae, uh, less than six microns usually, usually and uh, that's the differential diagnosis. And then on the right hand side, D, E and F are optical brightness used and then giving you the exact measurement and diameter of the hyphal structures, the hyphal width. And ideally you can, on top of what is given on the slides, ideally you can confirm the diagnosis by culture or molecular methods. Um, because this all is proof of invasive fungal infection, but it doesn't give you definite proof of what fungus you are, you are dealing with. All the pathways start with the most relevant aspect, and the most relevant aspect in the top box of the diagnostic pathway is this is an emergency. Even if you didn't confirm the diagnosis, but you suspect the diagnosis, it is an emergency. You need a team and you need to act fast. And what you do diagnostically depends largely on the type of patient. And there are six groups on this slide, six distinct patterns of disease and distinct types of patients and types of diagnoses and of patient histories and risk factors that follow this um, in, the, in the written version of the uh, Lancet ID paper uh, because it's a very busy slide and it's meant to guide you through that path with an individual patient. All the recommendations in the paper and there is a three-digit number of recommendations for all different diagnostic and treatment situations. All of this is always following the same table structure and I'll show you only one so that you can have, it, have seen it once and all the others you would find in Lancet and ID and in the web-only material coming with the uh, publication. So this is the table on first line antifungal monotherapy for mucomycosis and you already sense that there is another one on combination and another one on second and salvage uh, treatments. So we follow in these algorithms, and that's the first of the treatment pathways that I'd like to share with you, we follow the um, usual traffic light system. So red is what you should avoid, green is what is the ideal if you have it at hand, and this is the pathway for all therapeutic options available, and it refers only to adults. There are separate pathways for kids. If you are in a setting where you lack certain options, then your pathway might look like this. No liposomal amphotericin B available. That really narrows it down. It might be somewhat artificial, but there are some settings, as I learned, where there are modern azoles, but no liposomal amphotericin B. It could be just the other way around. It would again narrow it down, and that is another pathway in the paper but not in this uh, slide session today, not in the video abstract. National societies endorsing the guidelines are the ones on that slide. So 50 or 60 societies. What we learned while doing the guideline work, one world, one guidelines are feasible. The network clinically and lab-based mycologists, their network really strengthened and tightened during the work. It was a wonderful experience. Epidemiological studies certainly would benefit from a common set of denominators. It's not always easy or not always doable, but it's something that we desire for the future. Management of mucomycosis needs a dedicated and well-equipped team. You need to have experts in five or more different disciplines to adequately treat a patient. It's a deadly disease. And large parts of the global population has really limited access to such management opportunities. And that was, of course, nothing that we learned, we knew before, but we need to point at that issue. It's a shortcoming for the majority of the patients on the planet. So, Let's together work against mucomycosis and fight mucomycosis. And please share the video, like it, 
ring the bell and subscribe to the channel if you liked the video. Thank you very much. Goodbye.